So you like America Trends podcast, eh? Well, John, I just imagine that because if they're still here and listening to one of our podcasts, I would believe that uh, perhaps the person listening has listened before. I would assume so, too, given our numbers. So I think uh, I think we got a good thing going here. Well, we've got hundreds of thousands of people who have tried us and come back for more or visited our social media availabilities on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like. And we are really grateful, aren't we, John? Oh, yes, we are. Yeah, we love doing this, and we, we, I love the fact that we got people listening. I mean, it's really exciting. And they are reacting and retweeting, and uh, they're making certain to be engaged in the content that we have. And you know, John, we try to mount the tallest hill and be the reconnaissance team looking out for what's just ahead so we can warn people, uh, look out, danger ahead about your job, about your economic security, whatever it may be, social and political trends in our country. And I think we really hit on something, John. Oh, I think we hit on some really good topics. And if if you're just listening to this or just hearing this, you know, go back and listen to some of our episodes because there's a lot of great information and we get a lot of great people to uh, explain what's going on in the future that we should be looking at. Exactly. And we're not pigeonholed into the left, right, center thing. We really give you a lot of diverse opinions on this podcast. And we've been doing this since the mid-2017 period. And here we are in 2019. And the one thing that we're missing, John, and uh, I don't know, we've got to do something about it. We want some sponsorship because we've had the opportunity to utilize a studio. You and I providing our time, all the guests providing their time, but it would be great if we could enlist a sponsor in this podcast. Yeah, so please email us. Come on. Yes. If you'd <laughs> like to be a sponsor, maybe you've been listening for a long time. You really like the way we do it, our personalized, chatty approach, uh, the serious way that we interview. If you really would like to be part of this, and John and I can do a really fun message for you, but you've got to let us know that you're interested, and then we'll talk to you about the packages that we we can customize for you. So write to me, Larry Rifkin, at lrifkinr at gmail.com. lrifkinr at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, that would be great. What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends, Larry Rifkin and John Kropsik. And of course, we read a lot these days about the dysfunction, uh, the emotional uh, uncertainties of many of our young people. John, we're going to be talking today, and it's a really serious issue, about kids who are so marginalized in our society that they just about have no chance to oh, succeed. Boy, that is sad. That is really sad. And these are children, many of yeah. whom are caught in a foster care system simply because their families are so dysfunctional. You know, the attempt has been made in the recent years, John, to make certain that family reunification is the model for most of these child protection agencies all across the country. And most of the responsibility falls to states, though the federal government does have a responsibility here. But having said that, there are certain cases, John, where that family reunification is potentially more damaging to the child than even other forms of care outside of the family. Well, I, I, I believe there was a bunch of cases in Connecticut here about DCF, you know, bringing them back to their own family and then having all these problems. There were some suits and stuff that ensued, but yeah, you're yeah, absolutely it's a big problem. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the idea of having somebody with their biological mom or dad sounds great, but if they're a greater risk 
than a vetted foster family. But in any case, there are kids who are so dislocated in our society. Right now, we've got about 450,000 children in the foster care system, another 123,000 waiting to be adopted. So we really wanted to talk about this issue because, as you know, John, we deal with social and political issues, and they have to be put together because these social ills ultimately become political issues. Well, it just amazes me here in 2019 that, you know, this is a problem. You know, it seems like with all the stuff going on and all the agencies we have and everything, it seems like, you know, we'd be able to handle this somehow. But Well, I'll tell you, I did a documentary years ago on public television, uh, and it was about grandparents at that time, and now this goes back about 20 years, it was a new phenomenon at the time of grandparents having to raise their grandchildren, meaning that we had such a dysfunctional generation that was on drugs, that was not uh, capable of handling the duties of parenthood. And we know, you and I have uh, children, it, it's a lot. Oh, yeah, it's a it's lot of easy. work. It really is. <laughs> so this is a really important issue. Parenting the children left behind, those in risk-involved situations. So we wanted to deal with it in a very responsible way. So we're bringing on from the American Enterprise Institute, Naomi Schaefer Riley, and she focuses on child welfare. And she suggests, by the way, that there are things the federal government can do to help out in this regard. And I will tell you that uh, AEI doesn't often talk about the federal government as being a, a salubrious uh, institution to deal with issues. But this one so overarches uh, so many other concerns in our society. She feels that there is something to be said about the federal role in all of this. And we also talk about the kids and the plight that they find themselves in. I just don't know why it's not in the news more. You know, we don't hear about this problem. No, we really don't. Well, John, even if we're the only ones in this media landscape and on the podcasting horizon dealing with this, we'll give it voice today. The concern about foster care here on America Trends. Joining us on America Trends from the American Enterprise Institute, Naomi Schaefer Riley, and she's done a lot of work looking at the foster care system in America. Explain to us, Naomi, uh, who is in foster care in general, and is the system anything that is controlled by the federal government, or is all state by state? Sure. Well, nationally, there are about 440,000 kids who are in the foster care system, and the circumstances uh, that brought them there vary pretty widely. For some of them, they have been removed from their homes because of abuse or neglect by their parents or whoever it is they're living with. For some of them, they've had parents who have who died or become incapacitated or perhaps imprisoned as well. You have a, a situation in recent years where people are speculating that uh, the number of kids in the system is going up because of the opioid crisis. And you see a correlation in certain areas of the country where the opioid crisis has been particularly bad, that there has been a significant rise in kids going into foster care. Uh, that Though we have those federal numbers, they're each collected by the states uh, because states are actually in charge of child welfare policy. They are in charge of deciding whether kids need to be removed from their homes. They each have their own foster care system, their own adoption system that screens families for placing kids, and they're determining. They, they have each, each child welfare system in each state determines uh, where kids are going to be best off. And, of course, we are coming to you from the state of Connecticut, and we have had many controversies around our Department of Children and Families and the decisions yeah. that they make. And oftentimes there's a, a tragic end to a bad decision, even if the intentions are good, such as family reunification, which has really become a buzzword within this community. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, certainly over the last couple of decades, Family reunification or family preservation, as it's sometimes known as well, has become the primary goal of a lot of child welfare agencies. And you've had a situation where I think a lot of child welfare agencies sees the family as their client uh, rather than the child. And while it is certainly uh, tragic when a child has to be taken away from their family for reasons you know, of abuse or neglect, we have to be careful not to 
simply put that child back with the family uh, because we think that that those family bonds are are important. Uh, the child's obviously the child's safety and well-being is has to be our our primary concern. When we go from a family that's really in distress and a child ends up in the foster care system. And then the hope is either to get them back to the family or into adoption. So where does foster care really fall in? And is it kind of the neglected part of our system or one that is so misunderstood that we just don't pay enough attention to it? Well, I think uh, foster care is widely misunderstood, and that's partly just sort of the media, the headlines that you typically see. You often see cases that make the headlines where a foster family has uh, engaged in some kind of abuse or neglect themselves, and obviously the state is responsible for that because the state put them there. But, you know, those, those cases are actually a minuscule percentage of the abuse and neglect that we see of children nationwide. Much more common uh, is abuse or neglect by their own biological families. So I think that there is a great misunderstanding of of just who is in foster care. If you look at the most recent data, about a quarter of the kids who are currently in foster care are waiting to be adopted, meaning that they've had their parental rights have already been severed or they're well on their way to that having happened. And so one of the things that I've been interested in looking at in various states that I visited in recent years, uh, in Arkansas, West Virginia, and Colorado, and all over the country, I think you're seeing a renewed interest in finding permanent homes for those kids who are waiting to be adopted. As you may know, uh, the number of kids who are being adopted internationally has declined as a result of different policies that have been instated by the federal government, and I think that's partially responsible for a renewed interest in adopting domestically. And I think that a lot of especially faith-based organizations have been working very hard to try to increase the number of kids who can find safe, loving, and permanent homes. And what's the difference between somebody who decides uh, that they want to be a foster parent versus an adoptive parent? And are they often commingled where the foster parent really does want to uh, maintain the relationship and ultimately adopts the child? They are often commingled. A lot of states have a kind of category they call foster adopt. Um, which is basically for uh, parents who are looking to adopt and they first go through a kind of trial period in which the kid is, the child is technically in a, a foster care situation, uh, but it is kind of a trial period where they're waiting to be adopted. On the other hand, there are plenty of kids uh, who are, you know, who are in the foster care system and their the the goal for them, at least according to the Child Welfare Agency, is to be either reunited with their immediate family or to be placed with a different relative, or it could be that their you know their family is just sort of incapacitated in some way. Maybe there's a situation of of homelessness or uh, or illness uh, for their primary caregiver, and there's really nobody else available to care for them. In that case, they would be going into foster care. But uh, but parents you know who volunteer for that would be well aware that it would be a, a temporary situation for them. What are the incentives for someone to become a foster parent? I know there's some financial recompense, but of course, uh, raising any child for any length of time is expensive. And if you know that whatever bond you build with them is a temporary one in general, and they, again, may go back to their uh, biological family, what is the incentive I, I really think that the, the foster parents that I interview, certainly the best ones, you know, their their incentive is just to be able to provide a loving home for a child. And while they all acknowledge that there is heartbreak when that child goes back to their family, uh, if that child goes back to their family, there is that kind of, you know, feeling of separation. They are comforted by the fact that they've been able to provide that child with something that they desperately needed at that point. I think that the fact that it's, it's the, the financial incentives are not really very significant for most families is one of the reasons why you see so many faith-based organizations involved in this work. I think that so many people I talk to feel that it is their calling, uh, you know, almost uh, it is a religious calling for them to care for these orphaned and temporarily orphaned, in some cases, children. You know, the financial question is an interesting one. I, I certainly have no objection 
to the state trying to provide some financial recompense for this you know, additional expense that a family is incurring. But I think that obviously the concern is we don't want families to be going into this for financial reasons. And you know, some evidence points to the fact that, for instance, after welfare reform occurred in the 1990s, you had an increase in people who had been getting welfare benefits uh, then caring through for relatives through foster care so that they could access that money instead. And I think there that is a, a cause for concern because that's not obviously why you want adults to be taking care of children. And frankly, children are well aware of this. I mean, I have talked to foster kids, former foster kids and current ones, who know how much money the family is receiving for them and who know that, you know, the, the portion that is supposed to be set aside for their expenses is really being used for other things by the household. So that's certainly a problem. And, and frankly, what I would like to see is more, uh, you know, more, you know, solidly middle class families volunteering to be doing this kind of foster care and adoption, people who have in, you know, maybe they're empty nesters or they have an extra room in their house, people who can comfortably take in another child without having to worry about whether that extra few hundred dollars from the state is coming. When we look at a lot of social policy, we think that it has migrated to the federal level. And you just wrote a piece suggesting that the White House can help foster kids by enforcing existing laws, many of which were passed in the 1990s including the Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997. Explain what you think the federal government's responsibility is. So about half of the, um, they're called Title IV-E funds, but about half of the funds uh, for foster care for kids come from the federal government. So even though they are not directly responsible for these child welfare agencies, they are underwriting the cost of foster care. And so I think that federal government should be enforcing two laws in particular, the Adoption Safe Families Law that you mentioned. That really shortens the amount of time that kids are supposed to languish in foster care. Um, the, the law is really if you have been in foster care for 15 out of the last 22 months, you are supposed to, the, the, the state is supposed to move to sever parental rights. In meaning that you can't just be bounced back and forth into foster care, into different foster homes and back to your biological family as the state is not sure what to do with you. And right now, uh, that happens not only in the name of a desire for family reunification, we're always, we always seem to be giving these families one more chance to get it right with their kids, but also you're seeing that in family courts as well, which are really, uh, you know, prolonging these cases. Every hearing seems to end in an adjournment to six months or a year. I recently wrote a piece about family court in New York, and it just, it seems endless, the cases that these kids are involved in. And so I think we really, it's time for the federal government to really try to enforce that law. There was bipartisan agreement to pass it to say, you know, these kids, and especially for young children, their ability to attach to a to adult is, is so greatly impacted by their being consistently with one family uh, that we need to really shorten the timeline they're in foster care. The second law uh, again, passed in the 1990s with bipartisan support is the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, which said that we should not be taking race into consideration when determining um, where to place a child who's in foster care. That is, that whether the child is black and the parents you know, who want to adopt them are white or vice versa, that should not be a factor that we're concerned about. Race matching is not our goal here. Our goal should be finding loving, safe, permanent homes for these kids. And unfortunately, uh, the ideology that underlies so much of what is taught to child welfare workers, both uh, by the agencies but also in their own education, is all about race matching and, and ensuring that a black child is raised with a black family. There is a, a constant drumbeat about how we are child welfare agencies are tearing apart black families, and it's their goal to keep minority kids with minority families. But again, and the evidence here is that kids need loving, safe, permanent homes, not that they need somebody whose skin color resembles theirs. And again, the federal government could be doing a lot to be saying to states, this is the federal law, it's on the books, and we are not going to give you the money that you want until you start enforcing the law. And so uh, is the federal government rather lax at this point in terms of these enforcement uh, requirements? Absolutely. There's been uh, almost no sanctions based on these laws since they were passed. 
So I think, you know, a lot of people thought all they needed to do was pass these laws and then everything would work out. Unfortunately, uh, states have continued to go in their own directions and have really not, uh, their, the outcomes really have not been influenced, unfortunately, by the federal laws that are on the book. Naomi Schaefer Riley is with us, resident fellow in the areas of child welfare, foster care, and the impact of the opioid crisis on child welfare for the American Enterprise Institute. We go back many years and look at uh, the way that we dealt with uh, the issue of uh, children in distress in very difficult family situations. And there used to be more congregate situations. And just like so many other institutions, we de-institutionalized and felt that, uh, you know, being with one family or in a community was better. When did we move away from what some might remember as an orphanage? And are there any still left in America? Um, there are still uh, places that still have congregate care. Almost every state has some form of congregate care because um, particularly for, I think, the the hardest case kids, the kids who are having trouble living in a family who have severe behavioral problems, for instance, the, the congregate care seems like the option of kind of last resort. In some states it's more common than that. Like I was in Arkansas, they still have quite a bit of congregate care left. But you saw with the recent passage of the Families First legislation, part of that is that the incentives are really, uh, again, federal government's money, the incentives are really more toward moving away from congregate care. And I think it's it's really been a gradual move in, in over the last several decades. I mean, you know, f- foster care, uh, you know, the foster care system was not really something that, you know, existed prior to 50 years ago. And, and part of that is not necessarily the the institutional question. There were these institutions there, but most kids, uh, you know, who found that you know their parents could not take care of them, were cared for by extended family, by uh, other members of their religious institution, by people in their neighborhood, and and a, a lot of what you've seen, and you know, this is affects all areas of American life, is that people on the lower end of the economic uh, ladder now have fewer of those connections. They don't have those connections to religious institutions, to civil societies, and even extended families have shrunk significantly. And so a lot of these these children find themselves and these families find themselves without that extended support network that used to take in kids when they did not have any other option. And so now, like I said, the congregate care is really for kids who are, you know, who really don't have uh, any other options and for whom, uh, you know, foster families are really not available. I recently visited, I was in Utah actually recently visiting something called the Utah Youth Villages, and they have, you know, a, a congregate care model there where they're placing up to six six or eight kids in a home, but it's a partic- it's not sort of like what you imagine the Dickensian orphanage. It's about it's it's two parents, two married parents who are living in a home with these kids. They're having dinners together every night. They're trying to teach them how to live in a family uh, with the idea that they can either be able to go back to their own family eventually or be adopted. What prompted you? You wrote an article uh, back a few months. Uh, There are worse things than foster care. Child welfare agencies and judges too often prioritize family reunification over children's safety. And uh, there was this uh, list of the main focus of improvement on self-evaluation by the Department of Investigation. I think this was New York. And uh, permanency Uh, was rated much higher as an issue that they wanted to deal with than safety. And that really puts a lot of kids at risk, I would imagine. I think so. I think it's, I I looked at this report from the Department of Investigation, which was looking at, in in New York City, uh, child welfare is is, uh, overseen by the Administration of Children and Families. And so there was this report about children who were in foster care in New York and and the the incidences of abuse and severe neglect that they experienced and I was very surprised because the the incidences again were not Though, though these kids were technically in foster care, that is, their their cases were being overseen by these city child welfare workers, the abuse and neglect was actually happening at the hands of their biological families when they were going to visit them, you know, just for trial periods, for a day or overnight. 
And I thought to myself, well, you know, these are kids who we've already removed from these families because we know that they are in danger. And now we're just sort of, we seem to be pushing them back to these families too quickly if the result is that you have uh, hundreds of incidences of abuse and neglect that are happening at the hands of these very parents we've taken them away from. And that, I think that, that, that real push to get them back with their families, that reunification mentality is unfortunately overriding what should be our common sense about the, the kids' chances to, to, for safety. And Naomi, you remind us that many of the children whom the system fails, they're going to go on to become problems uh, for communities and very costly and uh, made, uh, you know, situations very difficult uh, in terms of where they end up, uh, both, uh, you know, within our prison system and the like. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, I'm certainly not the first person to notice that if we don't help these kids when they're younger and figure out what to do with this large population of kids who are at risk, who really don't have, you know, has families to help them, and who, you know, by the way, are, are as a result having trouble schools, you know, they're, um, they're more likely to obviously not, not earn a degree, to not be employable, to have difficulties with substance abuse and crime. We certainly, you know, people have talked a lot about the problem of foster kids who are aging out of the system. You know, to, to be 18 and find yourself with, with little education and no marketable skills and no family to uh, to fall back on, I think, is just is is a is a deeply unenviable position. It's one where we should all be worried about what the outcomes are for these young people. Oh, absolutely. What happens at that stage? Uh, I was going to ask you about that aging out. I'm glad you referenced it. I mean, these are kids in no man's land. They absolutely are. I mean, I think you know some states really try to encourage kids who are in foster care aging out. To, to kind of remain in the system a little bit longer. They'll, they'll continue to get some money from the state if they'll be willing to not, you know, emancipate themselves from the system. But so many of these kids have had such a bad experience with the system that they are eager to get out, um, but then they, of course, don't have the financial support. There's some transitional housing that I've looked at. I mean, these kids really need to be, you know, taught some very basic skills about how to live on their own, about how to manage money on their own, uh, how to get a job, where can they find an apartment. Um, And so there are different programs, you know, in different states that are really trying to set them up with mentors and trying to provide them with a kind of uh, education that they, basic life skills education that they haven't been provided with up until that point. And, uh, you know, and then there are also these, you know, different educational options, you know, colleges that are trying specifically to help kids who have been in foster care, you know, not only provide them with financial help, but also try to, to help them be able to, you know, to manage what it's like to, to take college classes, that sort of thing. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a large problem, and it's, it's going to require a lot of effort. In closing, you remind us that there are still many barriers to adopting children across state lines. So as much as this policy about uh, child protection generally is a state's responsibility with a um, heavy dollop of uh, federal overlay, that in fact we've got a lot of barriers between states in terms of uh, adoption. Absolutely. And again, this is something that I really think the federal government could go a long way to fixing. I mean, every child welfare agency, you know, technically is obviously responsible for ensuring that the kids who are in their care find the right family. But, you know, with a little bit of, you know, creativity, obviously they could work with other agencies to do that kind of oversight if they find a family in another state. I've recently been looking at a program that really I think will will do a lot to use you know, improvements in our collection of data in order to find families on in, in other areas of the country for kids who need a permanent home. But again, there's a lot we could be doing to break down these barriers. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Naomi Schaefer Riley on the foster care system in America. If people want to learn more and, uh, you know, pick up on your writings as well, uh, how can they do that? Sure. Well, I have um, a scholars page at the AEI website, AEI.org, and then I also have a, a personal web page, NaomiRiley.com, uh, where all my articles can be found, too. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us today on America Trends. Thank you. It was great talking to you. America Trends podcast is part of the MHNR Network. MHNRnetwork.com.